All right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, welcome to our workshop. My name is Courtney Lasser. I use she, her pronouns, and I am a senior here at WashU. And um, I will just be moderating this workshop. And I just have a few housekeeping notes before we get started. So this is workshop number 24, Building Resilient Farming Systems and Rural Communities Amidst Climate Change. This is a one-hour workshop, so we will conclude at 10 a.m. If you're looking for a different workshop, um, this would be your time to relocate. And before we begin, I just wanted to walk through a few items, both for people in this room and those who might be joining us virtually via Zoom or the Whova app. If you're joining us online, please keep your microphone muted um, until we are ready to take questions towards the end of the discussion today. And I will be monitoring the chat for questions. Um, and there are also a few ways that you can interact on Whova um, with the Q&A, which is a chance to submit questions directly to presenters, or the chat, which is a way to um, discuss with anyone who is in the online room. Also, a recording of this workshop will be made available in the next few days on the Whova app, and all of the content from this summit will be available on the app for the next three months. So make sure when you're entering a question or remark online that you're in the correct um, area of the Whova app. And again, I will be monitoring the Q&A and chat sections to help field questions for the speakers. So with that, I will pass this off to our presenters to introduce themselves. Do you have to use the mic or can we just? No, no. Okay. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. There's too many things to hold. So, um, my name is Wendy Johnson, and I just want to say that I'm very, very excited. Uh, both Ron and I are excited that um, climb, or, uh, agriculture is, is being touched on and talked about here and invited to talk about and present at the summit. Um, because food and agriculture are more than 24%, are about 24% of the planet's greenhouse gas emissions, and we should be talking about it. Um, so we hope that to show you today that, that we can be a big part of the solution, agriculture can. Um, as much as we are the problem, we can also be the solution. So um, this is me. I grew up on a farm um, in the 1980s. And long story short, I won't spend too much time on here, but I, um, I, I grew up on a hog farm um, in the 80s. Our family farm survived the 80s, but I had no interest in becoming a farmer um, because it was a real traumatic experience for all of us. And so I went as far as I could. I moved to Los Angeles um, and uh, studied fashion design and wanted to become a, uh, a stylist in Hollywood. And so I lived out in L.A. where I met my husband. And, but that's where I found food. That's where I discovered my love of food and realized that I needed to be uh, present in that, in that world um, because I came from an agricultural family. So I moved back um, to Iowa, in, my husband and I did, in 2010, and we became farmers. So um, a little bit of historical perspective. So I... My, as a child, my, gr my grandfather, he didn't own land um, until he was in his 50s, and he inherited some land from, my grandfather inherited some land, and then my father inherited that land, and so it was kind of a, um, uh, they wanted me to double the number of acres, so each generation doubled the number of acres, and I just wasn't interested in doing that, so I took a totally different turn. Um, and I just want to note too, I, so I'm holding a, an omnivore, but I'm ended up holding a ruminant. So um, there'll be a theme throughout this talk about, about that. So <clears throat> I live in three different farming worlds, um, a conventional, an organic, and a regenerative one. So on our, on our conventional farm, we are typically, we're about a thousand acres of corn and soybeans. And... Um, we use cover crops, um, we no-till, we uh, reduce our fertilizer use, um, but most of our corn goes to the nearby ethanol plant. 
and there's not a lot of strong premiums for non-GMO um, corn and soybeans, and not a lot of strong market signals for small grains. Um, so our, our corn and soybean system is very global, as you all know, and our commodities and our pricing is really related to conflict, um, international conflict, um, climactic events happening in Brazil, um, and a lot of world and global events that we have no control over. So <clears throat> as farmers, we don't have a lot of sovereignty, I guess. But we just keep producing. That's what we're really good at. And in my organic um, world, so I transitioned some um, acres to organic from the unconventional farm. And um, I started out, this is a typical uh, organic crop rotation of oats under seeded with pasture forages. Then we, then we pasture a few years, and then we plant corn, and then we plant soybeans, and we <coughs> go back around. So it's around a five to six crop rotation in a year. But I didn't really enjoy um, the tractor time. I, I don't really enjoy the tractor time. I do have to sit in the tractor most of the time, but I don't really enjoy it. And I also don't really enjoy the amount of fossil fuel that I use um, with several trips across the field because in organic agriculture, you need to use cultivation. So um, I, when I transitioned to organic, I transitioned 130 acres um, bit by bit to organic. And then through some um, very strong climactic signals, such as major flooding, um, I decided that there were some acres that I needed to just keep in my perennial pastures. At the time, I was also really interested in enjoying grazing. And so we increased our sheep flock quite a bit, and we, we custom grazed some cattle now, and we have a few cows of our own. But these areas that, are, that you've seen, these pictures, and my presentation is pretty picture heavy, it's more of a storytelling, I guess, today than anything, um, is that due to flooding, we, we, were, we have some very vulnerable areas of land. Um, we're at the bottom of a small watershed, for example, and so perennial grazing is, is, is ideal for some of the farm. But uh, as you can see, we are very flat. There are very little slopes where we are. I'm located in northeast, north central Iowa, um, and it is prime corn and soybean ground. And if you know, if anyone knows what corn suitable ratings are, CSRs, that's what our land values are based off of, um, as well as soil types. Um, we are our county is averaged 80 to 85 CSR. The higher the CSR, the higher value the property is, the land value is. So it's much more profitable to grow corn on this land than it is anything else. Meanwhile, I, have, I learned about Kernza, and um, I'm kind of marrying organic and regenerative together, and so I, I started planting Kernza. I was very excited about Kernza, um, a perennial intermediate wheatgrass um, that you can graze and have grain, produce grain off of. And so I planted some Kernza. Um, I'm really into perennial uh, agriculture, um, but you'll see it in a theme of my presentation that how do we make money off of perennial agriculture? There are groups such as uh, the Perennial Promise Growers Cooperative um, that helps market Kernza and Camelina and some other perennial grains. Um, Mad Agriculture is another Forever Green initiative out of the University of Minnesota. These are all um, groups that are helping create market, <coughs> market signals, I guess, for some of these, some of these grains. So on 130 acres, um, my husband and I, we've planted over um, 5,000 trees. We have about 2,500 more, more going in this year. Um, we have pollinator habitats. Um, we have wetlands. Um, for the first time in over 70 years, this 130-acre farm, which was where my grandparents uh, lived, um, is now perennial, 100%. Um, it's, that's a huge deal in 70 years. Um, and if you ever come to north, north central Iowa, you'll notice that our 130 acres is an island um, in terms of a sea of corn um, all around us. So I provide a lot of ecosystem services. Um, and I can tell what these ecosystem services are because I've seen 
a, a, a variety of birds and insects and amphibians and mammals that I have never really seen before. Even growing up on a farm, um, that was predominantly corn and soybean, um, but, did, but used less chemicals, um, I didn't see these things. And so for the first time, uh, my husband and I, we get to see bobolinks. There's a bobolink in, in that. You can't really see what that is, but it's a bobolink. And a bobolink is an amazing prairie grassland bird that flies all the way from Argentina all the way to the grasslands of, of the Midwest. And um, they're coming back. And so you let, you let something grow. You let um, um, grasslands grow back. Nature comes back. And our farm is noisy. If you go into a corn and soybean farm, it's silent. There's nothing. And you, go, you, you visit Ron's farm or, or my farm, and it's, you hear the sounds and the smells. and the, It's just really an amazing um, experience. Um, so there are groups like Thousand Farms Initiative. Um, John, Jonathan Lundgren is the lead scientist there. And he's, he helped start the Thousand Farms Initiative, and they are one of the first um, of its kind to begin to measure and have data to help provide a value for ecosystem services. And so last year they started out on um, a nationwide tour. I think they covered almost 400 farms across the U.S., and they measured these things. Um, they're starting to measure, and it's a 10-year study. So they'll be studying um, our farm in, I think, four to five different uh, times, um, taking some of these, these kinds of tests. And I know by the 10th year, we're going to get some really great data. So in 2023, um, we're starting to, there's a, there's a complete disconnect between you know, kids in school and farms. In rural America, all they see is corn and soybeans when they take the bus or they drive out of the city limits. You know, it's corn and soybeans. And so we really want to showcase that there are other opportunities outside of corn and soybeans um, and that there are other ways to farm outside of, of conventional corn and soy. <clears throat> so this is a, 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 a chart. What I really want you to focus on is um, the, the cover crops and no-till value and the riparian and, and uh, riparian buffer, riparian cover, um, that kind of value. So ripe is um, a, a, a program or proposal out of Minnesota. Um, it's called Rural Investment to Protect Our Environment. Um, and it's a proposal to directly pay producers a minimum, of, a minimum of $100 an acre or animal unit for voluntary land stewardship that can provide a greater benefit to the public. And I think so the public is a really great way of saying ecosystem services is a public benefit. So cover crops and no-till, you can see, they're great, but you know they're, they would get a, a lower dollar amount versus the ecosystem services provided in riparian buffers, filter strips, riparian covers, um, and grass covers. This study came out of the University of Wisconsin and Grasslands 2.0, um, and they, they're highlighting the, this study highlights the benefit, the perennial system benefits in comparison to a corn and soybean um, um, system. And <clears throat> so like soil erosion, um, nitrate loss, storm runoff, soil carbon stored. If you notice the tons or the pounds um, per acre, a no-till corn soy with no cover crop is in the minus for carbon. Um, and a pasture-managed grazing system is in, is in the 5.3 tons. Um, so you can see really this, the, the major differences here of what a, a, a managed grazing um, system is compared to even a corn soy no-till with cover crop. This is the kind of data that we need. And if there are any researchers out there, this is the information that, that um, we need to further the value of ecosystem services. So here I transformed 130 acres from corn and soybeans to grasslands. Um, and I, I'm planting some trees, I'm doing some civil pasture work, so integrating some agroforestry. 
And so just on grasslands alone, um, I plugged in the Comet Planner. If anyone knows what Comet Planner is, I plugged in. And for example, my equivalent uh, greenhouse gas emissions um, is 7.7 .7 million, or, sorry, yeah, 7.7 .7 million miles driven by a gas-powered car over 20 years. So imagine there's 90 million acres planted in corn in the United States every year, or so far, increasing. Um, imagine what we could do to reduce emissions in just a tenth of that 90 million acres. So the reality is we're still in a corn, is, corn and king paradigm. Corn is king paradigm. So ethanol has recently had a new resurgence. Um, <clears throat> I just attended a meeting at our local ethanol plant that was offering a five cent premium for uh, identity preserved corn, um, which doesn't have a lot of meaning, but it's the ethanol is sold to Japan and the EU um, and Canada <clears throat> that are willing to pay for identity preserved ethanol that's coming from the United States. Um, and so we think that this is just a start to the, an energy source certification um, as they so-called wean themselves, as we wean ourselves off of fossil fuels, but it's really kind of greenwashing that we're, we're not. Um, so, <clears throat> and meanwhile, Iowa has kind of become this very, this not only a dumping ground, but an extractive place that um, people are taking. We aren't necessarily giving back into Iowa. And so there's a carbon pipeline proposal that's coming through Iowa um, that's privately owned um, that will take uh, carbon from ethanol plants and pipeline it to areas in South Dakota and other places and, and pump it underground. So on a 45-acre field, this is just a, a very uh, summarized and simple look at the difference in income that a farmer like me um, can, can, you can take away. So a conventional corn system, my net income is around $644 an acre, um, and a, a perennial sheep and, and cattle grazing system on the same 45-acre field, uh, I'd net about $311 an acre. Um, that's not including rent. So if I had rental rates in here, which range from $300 to $300 an acre, I'd make nothing, basically, on a perennial sheep and cattle grazing system. And I, won't have, I don't have any crop insurance safety net, and I don't have a farm program. I was at a, I don't know if any of you uh, uh, know of um, um, card clubs, if any of you are involved in card clubs, but still in the Midwest, we do a little bit. And I was at a card club the other day, and, and I, there are a bunch of farmers that they're card, we card club with, and, and um, they were saying that, hey, 5,000 acres is going to be the new norm. 1,000 acre farms and less, they're just not going to exist anymore. So there's this huge consolidation movement. And I think there, my point is with this, we really need to change and turn it around. We really need to start changing things and thinking about how to create value, um, outcomes, and, and invest in those outcomes. So here are, I didn't pass it, here are some government program payments um, that were received. So on our conventional farm, um, I put in 900 acres here, uh, we received about, we received a lot more than our perennial grain farm. But if you divide the acres into the dollar amounts, it actually comes out to be about the same per acre. But my costs are very dramatically different. So my costs for the, the government programs that we received on a conventional corn and soybean um, farm were only $5,000, and that's just to do some drilling of some prairie seed, for example. But on the perennial farm, um, I had major costs, and I didn't receive any kind of farm program or cost share, a large enough cost share to cover those expenses. So the, the cost share that the, that the U.S. or the the USDA is, is providing isn't enough, and it's not up to date. Um, I've looked into carbon and ecosystem service markets. Um, I'm sure you've heard of some of the, the carbon, uh, carbon markets coming about, but 
Uh, they require a really large number of acres, more than a thousand. Um, you have to be doing some of those practices for over five years. So, um, and it's not set up for these smaller acreages or those that are, are preserving forests um, or planting forests and grasslands. Trees um, are starting to pick up because they can, they can uh, look at satellite imagery of biomass, um, but those are only right now in Iowa for newly planted soil pasture. It's very specific. So I've come to the, the conclusion that the solution needs to be that um, companies and for-profits and consumers and government as a, as a collaboration need to pay for the costs of, of implementing ecosystem services um, and practices because it is a public service. What we're doing is a public benefit. So for example, I, we reduce our fossil fuel use. We, we plant deep-rooted perennials. And, and these things I'm gonna say are, and they're listed on some flyers that you have here, they are not new knowledge. This is all, this indigenous peoples, they, have, they know this knowledge from the very beginning. They have been practicing this. Um, so this is not new. Plant deep-rooted perennials that draw down carbon, graze ruminants responsibly, use regenerative cropping systems, um, use compost, and really promote more diversity on the land um, with species and people. So meanwhile, climate change is here. It's happening. This is one of our fields that was flooded. It, this is corn. We had three tornadoes in 2021. Um, it's really difficult to combine corn that looks like that. Um, trees falling down. We have duratios in Iowa. <coughs> duratios in, in December. And tornadoes in December. Um, this is some soil erosion from my neighbor's field um, that tilled up their soybean stubble. Um, I have a, a, a big blue stem wetland that's right next door, and I got all their soil. <laughs> <laughs> and I captured all their snow, so I'm, I'm pretty excited about that. But that, this is happening. If you drive across the Midwest, uh, you see this kind of wind erosion everywhere. Um, this is, uh, on the right side, is a fall armyworm. I had fall armyworm in, um, fly up with hurricane winds from the south, and they started to eat all my forages that I was stockpiling for the winter. Never had that happen before. This is a, a duratio in South Dakota. A friend of mine took this picture. Um, it looks like a dust bowl. This is soil in May, just flying up into the air, and, and it turned uh, black in the town in Brookings, South Dakota. Her whole city just turned black for about 10 minutes. Um, there were these prairie fires in Nebraska, in Kansas, in southern Iowa. Thousands of acres of corn um, was burned due to drought. So, um, we have a community, though, uh, and community helps us become resilient. And so this community of climate land leaders, um, which are a community of landowners that are sharing ideas and successes and partnerships and struggles, um, and we, we're learning from each other as, as we move through worsening climate change. And here just, here's just a quote from one of our um, members. Climate land leaders is about empowerment. I sometimes feel so powerless in the face of climate change and industrial farming. Seeing others' projects and successes is inspiring. So here, community is important and it helps us be resilient. Um, we share positive solutions and how climate change is affecting us. In the next two years, our goals are to um, invite or have 210 individuals who control over 75,000 acres in the Midwest to participate in our programs or in our, in our membership um, and to be really proactive on federal policy. Um, you know, the farm bill, this is a farm bill year. We are very, we're being very active um, in that and partnering with other organizations to do that work. Uh, and if you know of anybody who, oops, I can't go back. Um, who wants to be a climate land leader, please have us, please contact me. So thank you. I'm going to get it up here. Thank you. There you go. <clears throat> well, thank
thank you, Wendy, for that uh, wonderful job and wonderful presentation. Uh, I didn't have, have to travel to Los Angeles to figure out that I was going to be a farmer. <laughs> but uh, I did get to go to California about 15 times over a seven-year period because I was on the Organic Farming Research Foundation board in Santa Cruz and, and from 1997 to 2004 and got to be the board president of that uh, for the last three years. So we learned a lot about uh, California agriculture. Uh, I'm just going to talk briefly, an introduction, introduce myself. Uh, this, I'm starting my 50th year of farming this year, 40 years without any chemicals. Became certified organic in 94, 1994, on the crops, uh, certified organic on the livestock in uh, 2000 because we could not, we didn't have a label until the, the National Organic Program was created in uh, the year 2000 that included uh, meats. So, uh, 700 acres, uh, pretty much all contiguous. We have three sons, the two older sons. Uh, the oldest one came back from Minneapolis to farm in 2014. He's now 42. Our next son is uh, going to be 40. He, he started in 2007, right after attending Iowa State. And the, all of our three boys went to Iowa State, and I graduated from there in, back in 1973. And my wife went to Creighton University in Omaha, and uh, she was a city gal mm -hmm. and was the news bureau director and assistant PR director at Creighton when we got married. So uh, the the hardest challenge for her was not getting married. It was moving to a small town and becoming a, slowly becoming a farmer. That's not easy. Uh, anyway, what else? Oh, my Practical Farmers of Iowa. I had the privilege of helping to start that organization back in 1986. And we started as a small group of farmers doing randomized replicated uh, research trials and did the statistics analysis ourselves uh, because many of us studied statistics, you know, at Iowa State. Uh, many of these folks went to Iowa State. And I just wanted to say we have a former executive director in the audience, Teresa Opheim, who's now the executive director of uh, Climate Land Leaders, the group that uh, Wendy works so much with. So anyway, we started with about 100 people. Now we're up to 6,500. Yeah, it's pretty impressive. Uh, our son, David, the oldest, our oldest son is the first second generation board member, and he's now the vice president. So I'm pretty proud. You know, we're pretty proud of that. That's enough. Well, I guess I should, I would say, I, on our farm, we've done around 45 to 50 randomized replicated trials over the last uh, 37 years. So, and we continue to do that. Uh, I looked over my slides last night, and boy, I decided I need to update my slides, and I didn't do it. So I'm not going to use them that much at all. Partly because I, you know, there's three major greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, CO2, and methane, uh, 25 times greater than CO2, but doesn't last as long. Nitrous oxide, most people don't, e don't even know what that is. That's the sleeping killer. The fertilizer industry likes to keep that quiet. I'll talk more about it. It's 300 times more powerful than CO2 and, and uh, very potent. Um, 
you know, Wendy said agriculture's 24 percent. Well, I tell you, that one, when you look it up, you see 9 percent, you see 11 percent, but then you see as much as 40 percent or higher. And I, I think that not entirely clear, but a lot of the production costs that go into fertilizer and chemicals, etc., everything in that process up front into the input side is not figured in. That's the big problem, you see. And it makes agriculture look like, well, they're not much of a problem. Well, that's, a, we're, we're, uh, that's simply not truth. I always like to talk about photosynthesis and anybody, does anybody know what I stupid me left out of the equation up there? On the yield side, I studied biology for <laughs> crying out loud and I forgot to put it in. The carbon disappeared. The carbon disappeared. <laughs> You're right. I saw that last night and I thought, oh my God. <laughs> but Okay, that all life depends on photosynthesis, right? Plants, everything that feeds us initially either is the plant and then an animal consumes it or we consume it. We're an animal, of course. And so then you have that and then you have respiration, which is how we get CO2, right? We contribute to that every time we take a breath. Etc. And it's obvious, right, that uh, if you if you study that equation, it kind of explains why we have climate change, right? You guys understand all, all that, I hope, but most people don't. They skipped biology or general science or didn't learn it because when you burn carbon either in the food we eat or the fuels, which is old carbon, you know, and in four to 500 years, we've pretty much used up the easy carbon, haven't we? In just that small time frame that took millions and millions of years to get there. So that's the problem. Well, what can farmers do? to mitigate the effects of climate change. Is it by sequestering carbon? Is it by lowering CO2? There's two differences there. You know, you hear everybody talks about sequestering carbon. That's hard to do. It's not easy on, in soils, especially uh, young soils, relatively young soils like the Midwest, glaciers created our soils in the last 20,000 years. The last one was 10,000 years ago. In those soils, the research shows the only system you can sequester carbon with in that system, it's not organic crops, it's not conventional crops, it's not even a, a rotation with small grains and alfalfa. It is only in pasture or prairie or trees. It's the only way to sequester carbon. But you can lower CO2. Isn't that our mission here too? Right. So let's not confuse those two. The one that sticks out to be there, addressing soil quality. That is an important one that farmers are starting to really key in on. Conventional farmers too are getting excited over this. A lot of bigger farmers in Iowa, for instance, want to improve their soil quality. So then they start out by planting cover crops and then they start asking more questions. And that's where a lot of our hope lies with people that are asking questions. Questioning this terrible stranglehold of industrial ag that we live under, all of us as consumers, as citizens, we are captives and it just burns the hell out of me. I've been fighting that for all my life.
and it's 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 not an easy battle. A lot of people have been fighting. A lot of people in the policy world, like the Sustainable Ag Coalition, which I'm a member of, uh, they fight it every day trying to figure out policy. And I admire them for their stick to itiveness. I have to get back out and farm. I just can't do that on a daily basis. It's too frustrating. It really truly is. Well, here's that study that verifies what I talked about with uh, cropping systems. This was done 30 years in Wisconsin, 30 year cropping system. There in the red, you know. Only the pasture system is positive above zero for sequestering carbon. And do you guys understand? Okay, the crops take CO2 from the air through photosynthesis. So that's a, you know, a net positive. But then during that three and four month period, the microbes in the soil converting that CO2 are, are uh, there we eating the sugars and the, all the C6H12O6 and converting it back to CO2. So the and that's why you know the problem of uh, uh, permafrost is such a problem because the bacteria are because of warming temperatures, you know, tremendous amounts of methane and. Uh, uh, carbon dioxide being released because of it. And then here's another study, Dr. Matt Liebman at Iowa State. You know, essentially, well, look, what he was looking at was comparing a two year rotation, the, the, the one everybody does, corn and soy. Just comparing that to adding one year of something else like oats and then a red clover with planted with the oats, or a four year rotation where you add one year of or two years of alfalfa. Well, in this one it was just one year. But he wasn't sequestering carbon, but he, he's what he's saying is you're not only lowering CO2. But you're lowering all these other things like nitrogen, like herbicides, nitrates, fossil fuels, soil erosion, energy usage, all of that because of these, because you're lowering your fertilizer and your chemical inputs with the oats and the alfalfa, you see, because most farmers don't put herbicides on their oat fields. Although, <laughs> sad to say, so many farmers are putting glyphosate, Roundup, mm -hmm. on their oat and wheat fields mm -hmm. so that it kills everything before they harvest so that the seed is all ripening at the same time. Yeah, it's crazy. It's insane. In fact, I want to talk about Life has stayed a little bit. You only have 20 minutes, Ron. What's that? <laughs> well, <laughs> <geez. say> that. <laughs> well, I'm just briefly going to say 300 million pounds supplied in the U.S. every year. Maurice, any, do you know about the most recent study? American Cancer Institution. Very reputable, right? All of us have glyphosate in our urine. But all of us, whether you're farming or not, is what the study showed. Well, what that case, okay, so what? It's what conventional says. But the study showed that in the cells of our DNA, there's an oxidative process going on that is cancer causing. And it's causing oxidation of DNA, which it's adding oxygen in that chemical process there. And it changes the structure. And the research shows, which 
pe people have been suing Mott's or Bayer over is the lymphoma, uh, non Hodgkin's lymphoma, especially leukemias and uh, different melanomas, different bladder cancers, uh, uh, Parkinson's disease, all these new emerging disease that are really becoming more prevalent now. So that is very concerning. Just extremely concerning. All right. So this is uh, our neighbor on the right in 2011. That's us on the left. In uh, May, I ended up turning him in as a whistleblower. He's my neighbor to NRCS, but it was the best thing that happened. Uh, we respect one another. He has a 6,000 head feedlot a mile from us. We respect one another. He would do anything to help me out. I would do the same. That's the reality of how, how do we get along with our neighbors back home? That's not easy. And there's two really different kinds of agriculture going on. But I turned him in, and he ended up having to put headlands and uh, along all of his land, which amounts to thousands of acres, not just here, but all of his farms. Is he talking to you now? Hmm? Does he talk to you now? Oh, of course. Yeah. He knows you turned him in? Yeah. Well, I talk, I, I talk to him. Uh, although he had to send his wife down to talk to <laughs> uh, I'm not going to talk much about this. Talk more later about some of this. This is what we do at our farm. We have over 50 fields more than 20 species every year. And we're not flat like windy. We have rolling hills. But I love the hills, the, the diversity, you know. The landscape is more, uh, I think, uh, conducive to uh, all kinds of good things. Right. All this nitrous oxide, I suppose we're better to talk about that because Yesterday, you know, we, we went to the Miss, Mississippi, and not too many people want to talk about nutrient reduction strategy. You guys know about that? Twelve states in this region, the Missouri, Mississippi, uh, watershed, one of the largest in the world, it's supposed to reduce nitrogen loads and phosphorus loads by 35%, 40%. It's by the year 2035. Oh, that's just a bunch of BS if I ever heard it. Iowa has spent $560 million of taxpayer money to promote all these practices. Good practices. Voluntary. There's hardly 4 to 5% of the farmers doing any of it. And the data shows it will take hundreds, if not thousands, of years to meet that goal. Now, all the farmers would have to do, and I mean this, is use the right amount of nitrogen that the plant needs, to, the corn plant needs, mainly corn. People don't fertilize soybeans because they're a legume. Do you know about that? Legumes create their own nitrogen. Alfalfa is a legume. I haven't applied any nitrogen purchased since 1982. See, I farm with chemicals for 10 years. I know that world, and I grew up in that world. Uh, my dad died before in 1980. I should I give him all the credit in the world. He never gave up on the crop rotations and the hogs and the pigs, and the hays, the legumes. The diversity, he never quit that. And because he never quit that, the farm program, the subsidies penalized and continued to penalize farmers like us because it was all based on how much corn you grew 
You had a corn base, and it follows you through till eternity. And I'm not kidding you. So now subsidies are kind of gone because of ethanol and high prices. 55% of the corn in Iowa goes to ethanol. 45 to 50% in, in this country goes to fuel, not food, for crying out loud. 90% of our food is imported in every state here. So, gosh, when are we going to do something? means anything. Policy. You people, we're counting on you. We truly are, especially you young people. The consumers, and we got to be badgering our politicians to no end, to tell them the truth. Because rural communities are going to be no longer. I can attest to that. I live in one. Our church made clothes. The schools closed in the 70s, our school. The mergers are six, seven schools at a time. You know, the name is so long, you can't even figure out what it is, you know? And like Wendy says, if they're talking 5,000 acres as a norm, come on. It doesn't have to be that way, I can tell. And if I better close here because I'm getting on my preaching rant. <laughs> it doesn't have to be that way if the truth is known and if we start demanding something as a whole population. And that include, you know, we have to do things as curtailing the lobbying power of all the ag people or corporate people, whether it's Democrat or Republican, it doesn't matter. They both, we are, they are both captive to the industrial food and ag model and the industrial, you know, model, period. Yeah, they're trying to do things about social media and blah, blah, blah and stuff that people, that affects maybe you guys every day, but you guys, the general public doesn't know anything, or hardly anything about food in rural areas. That's what I'm saying. Not enough. Well, this is the sum of what we do. I can talk all day, you know. But the key, I'll just say the key is to keep something growing year-round on the farm. See, you prevent soil erosion. You use up CO2. You have all these win-wins. And you let Mother Nature do the heavy lifting. You don't have to let technology do this. Let Mother Nature do it. She do, does a better job than, than us, if you allow her, with the legumes and the rotations and the diversity and moving towards permaculture, yes, planting fruits. and Like we're doing all that stuff, so fruits and nut crops, et cetera, for the future. You know, all that has got to be part of it. Well, there's some Piggies. <laughs> we we have about 350 head a year. We used to do 2,000 back in the days of uh, in the 80s in the conventional world when we had competition in packing plants. You know that in Iowa there's 23 million hogs today, 50 million chickens. All everything is stacked into on top of each other. No wonder we have bird, bird flu, avian flu, that you've heard about. You've got to have livestock, some proper numbers of livestock back out on the land, whether it's hogs, cattles, or cattle or chickens. We do something no farmers do anymore. We let our cattle run over the whole farm after the harvest. Farmers all used to do that. Now there's no fences in the Midwest. There's hardly any fences. We compost uh, 1,000 tons of manure annually. Composting is shown to decrease methane. 
Again, diversity in trees. These are actually old pictures. They're planted 40 years ago, on, more than 40 years ago on the left. Well then, so we tried to address the marketing and the local food systems. We have a store on the farm, that's my wife there. And then um, our son and daughter-in-law started, we have a local foods restaurant in the town of Harlan, which is 5,000 people in Western Iowa. And we have a food hub too, farm table delivery where uh, Ellen and her staff buys food from about 60 growers and resells and distributes it. So I think I better quit because we're going to run out of time. But, you know, just a couple of things. <laughs> You've got to do full cost account. <clears throat> That changes everything, doesn't it? If you put your true cost of production on anything we do in this world, life cycle analysis, let's say, all of a sudden our kind of farming blows, blows everybody out of the water because we don't have all these uh, fertilizer and chemical and uh, questionable inputs, you know. So, anyway, uh, thank you and well, we better take some questions. So for, for both of you, um, what percentage of Iowa farmers do you think are engaged kind of in the way you guys are engaged? And what are the barriers to get, get that number a lot higher? But, uh, uh, the question is, what are the barriers to transitioning more acres to what we're doing from corn and soybeans. Um, I showed you the economic model up there. That's the biggest reason. Um, also, farmers are, they don't like regulation. They don't like paperwork. They don't like government in general, um, even though they get subsidies from the government. Um, but it's, uh, I think it's a, it, it's mostly, that, that's mostly it. Um, it's harder work. You know, there are, the age, average age of a farmer is 57, 59, something like that in Iowa. Um, and it's harder and harder to get next generations economically to come back to the farm. And so the, the land is not there to be able to do some of these diversifications um, that we're doing. I'd, I'd like to add to that that we're all captives of the technology to Peer pressure is a big thing. Farmers like their big iron. They like to brag about how big the combine is and how big the tractor is and how much, you know, their 24 row planters, et cetera. Uh, that's a big issue. Uh, but also, if you're listening, if you're getting your information from the fertilizer and seed and chemical dealers and not, getting it like a, we do in Practical Farmers of Iowa, we learn from other farmers. We learn from each other. How do we do this? Yeah, no. <laughs> we'll go this way. Sure. Um, this might be a question for others in the room as well, so feel free to chime in, but um, what's the likelihood that we see funding for ecosystem services included in the upcoming farm bill? I, that's kind of a, it's a heavy one, but it yeah. seems to be the elephant in the room. Well, I see Kathy Day from NSAC is on the Whova app, and she's been putting in some inputs there. So I, I would, uh, she is putting in some links. I checked that out. I saw in the chat. Um, but we we're very hopeful. But there's, I mean, as a farmer, I'm hopeful. But looking at how Congress is made up, I don't see a lot of a lot of movement um, in terms of ecosystem services. But we, we need to start, we need to be talking about it. And the more we talk about it, the more uh, everyone knows about it and more everyone else can talk about it. Ron, did you have anything? Well, I, I would only add that uh, 
become aware of the National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition, NSAC, because they have done more than anyone for the last 40 years to get what we do have, the good programs like SARE, Sustainable Ag Research and Education Program, uh, beginning farmer programs, all the farm bill stuff. It's through their efforts in Washington, D.C. And, you know, there's 100 and some organizations under that umbrella. So consider finding out more about NSAC. Thank you. Uh, in the, the Right 100 program that you mentioned, there was a proposed benefit of $100 per acre, or, or payment of $100 per acre, and then I think a benefit of like 100000 And is that per acre also? Or how do I compare those the payments to the benefits? Um, so, Teresa, do you know more about that program than I do? Um, I just know that it's a, a $100 per acre uh, benefit to the producer for... Um, and I don't know if the hundred thousand dollars is a cap. I'm not sure. I don't know. I would it's guess a it's a cap. It's a, it's a proposal. Um, oh, it hasn't been implemented, or it needs to be passed by several. Uh, it's not quite clear, but it's just a proposal. Okay. Yeah. I'm curious. What are your main strategies for managing pests uh, without synthetic pesticides? Could you repeat the question? Uh, what are your strategies for managing pests without pesticides? Uh, in our case, I have never lost or even come close to losing a crop due to pests. In the early days, once in a while, you'd, I would get some problem, maybe some cutworm or, uh, no. well, uh, I would say now because of soil quality and getting the right combinations of bacteria and fungi and so forth and diversity and crop rotations changing that every year more or less yeah every year we never grow the same crop two years in a row never so that right away is a good strategy now the conventional world would say because Corn is uh, BT, Bacillus thuringiensis. You know, that trait is engineered into uh, all the conventional corn, that that is controlling our European corn borer. And so that's why our organic growers don't have that. But uh, I, there might be some truth to that one. But uh, there, if you needed to control that Bacillus thuringiensis, we could apply that to our crop. I did one year, in fact, when the extension person, entomologist, came out and said, you got to do something. Well, I compared that to where I didn't put any on. I saw no yield difference. So. I know that vegetable growers, they use beetle banks or they have like habitats for, yeah. for beneficial insects um, to help with pests. But I, I would have to reiterate that diversity is the key. Having a real diverse amount of gra grains and livestock and uh, different types of uh, growing systems is, is, yeah. is important. Birds and insects, creating the habitat for or mammals. You wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't believe Matt Liebman did the study on how much, uh, how many weed seeds, for instance, uh, field mice would consume. In fact, our son Daniel was his in his research. Uh, did the research or had, it was his lab technician? He got so sick counting that, that stuff. Anyway, question to clear the back. Hi, I kind of can't see you, so I'll just stand. Um, thank you both for your presentation. Really appreciated it. I was wondering, as both of you are located in Iowa, knowing the huge boom of concentrated animal feeding operations that's happening in Iowa. And knowing that some of these environmental programs that we have, such as EQIP, the Environmental Quality Incentives Program, or the Conservation Stewardship Project or Program, we know that those are going towards these these capos, right? So I'm just wondering, as Iowa farmers, you know, how do you, how are you guys framing that, especially when it's your neighbors, cities around you that are coming up with these huge, giant, you know, facilities that are just doing so much damage, especially in terms of methane. So wanted to see what you both thought. Can you repeat that? <laughs> well, what are we? 
what are we doing in Iowa to try to better the situation with uh, uh, CAFOs and the problems they create, but also the monies they get, such as methane digesters and so forth, uh, to solve the problems. And uh, I feel very guilty about not confronting legislators more. I actually ran for state representative way back in 2008, and I got close. I, I could have probably made it someday, but I didn't want to. I took no PAC money, refused to. You know, it's very hard to be a politician these days and, and not lose your soul by compromising what you really believe needs to be done. But I would say, uh, uh, again, uh, being at the table with the, who's making the decisions is so important. Uh, I, I just add that the, the DNR is really head of the uh, master matrix, which is, I don't know if it's across other states, but in Iowa, it's, it's the regulation for these CAFOs. And uh, there's lots of loopholes in this master matrix to, to uh, resolve that it's legislation. And so we all have to be active participants in speaking to our legislators about what matters to us. Um, that's really the only way. As farmers, we talk to our neighbors uh, mostly about water quality. That's something that we all uh, are, are behind, conventional and, uh, um, well, I'd say most are behind. And so if, if we find things that we can relate and talk about that we, we both care about, I think you get further. Um, but money is money, and a CAFO makes a lot of money, and um, they're probably not, anything that I say is probably not going to stop them from building one. Well, I think, you know, we have to work at uh, climate change is going to exacerbate all these things that are a problem now. And I think there's going to be a lot more suffering on a daily basis. And once that happens more and more, maybe the time will come that we can make those kinds of changes. I, but we have to get the incentives so that the incentives reward the green practices all across the board, like, like what we're talking about uh, with environmental Benefits, you know, services. ecosystem services. <laughs> now, how much can we change conventional ag is the bottom line. I think they have to start coming to the table and realize that they can't keep doing this the way they are. Are they going to do that? They want to be in control. No matter, it's all outcomes. They want to control the outcomes. And the greenwashing is huge. And the public, what the public, you know, look at the problems with our media now with what people listen to. So if we incentivize the positive yeah, outcomes, yeah. that's what's going to turn the table. Exactly. And uh, versus incentivizing the wrong outcomes. We're incentivized, if we start incentivizing these ecosystem services, that can change the tide. Um, it's all about the money. It's all if about the money. Farmers, in their hearts, I think, want to do the right thing, the majority of them. Yeah. But they're not going to do it unless there's a financial incentive that's not too difficult either. <laughs> a lot of them don't want to, you know, think on their own or be involved a little more in management and whatever. Thank you both. Tyler? Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to comment a little bit about uh, the showman's earlier question on, on the barriers too. And one of the things that I, I see is, you know, the, the magnitude of loss of generational knowledge. Yeah. You know, as we went from the 1950s to the 1980s farm crisis, the big, you know, get big or get out. You know, we, we've, we've become accustomed to only understanding how to grow one, two, maybe three crops top on a large scale very well. So we lost a lot of that 
generational knowledge of how to do diversified cropping systems. And, and I guess one of the other barriers I'm really curious, Ron, that you faced, having sort of been a leader of the pack and going against the grain on this, um, and thinking about the 50 fields that you're operating on, 20 different crops, the infrastructure needs that you needed. And, and we look at the conventional agricultural system, it's very much locked into a very capitally intensive, you know, big iron, costly machinery that locks them in to those operating systems, whereas you're doing a much more diversified. But I'm curious, how, how did you support that? Was the infrastructure in place, you know, to, to get that grain off the field and into the supply chain? Were there elevators close by that were able to handle that? How did that look and, and what does that look like going forward? Not at first, of course, not in the 80s or even into the 90s. The Japanese, historically, the Japanese changed a lot of things in the Midwest by demanding and looking for organic tofu, tofu soybeans in the early 90s. So that infrastructure came. And then with uh, the advent of organic livestock, after, after the year 2000 is when that really took off. Now, a lot of us organic producers may not like the big poultry broiler and organic poultry and egg producers, but it's because of them that we can sell 1150 corn or $25 soybeans. Without them, we'd be up correct. So, unless we change the whole food pyramid. So, uh, one vision I have, you know, I've talked a little bit about it with uh, uh, the guy from Kansas City that was speaking yesterday. He's an urban planner. But I think we need to develop food systems both local and regional, around metropolitan areas with mayors and city councils and all the polit politicians and all the entities needed so that people see that there's a responsibility that they have to all the farms around them, too, that could be supplying their a good share of their food and finding ways to start that in numbers that make a difference. You know, that's the only way I think we have to create volume and numbers of farms. And then we can revive rural communities that way too. A new generation of smaller farmers. That's starting to happen a little bit, but we need to coordinate it. One thing we're doing in PFI is we're creating an umbrella of nonprofits with the major food hubs in Iowa to do this, just that. It's very hard to make a lot of, or any money with a food hub unless you got volume. So maybe this, we hope that will work. It's gonna take a couple of years to even get it to that point. But we're not gonna quit, we're not gonna give up. Eventually, mother nature will win. I, and I mean that with all my heart and, and soul and brain. So there was someone from the Iowa Environmental Council that spoke yesterday talking about the solar panels uh, and solar in Iowa with, in combination with wind. And there's a question on the app about uh, solar, uh, solar generation. And that is a great opportunity, I think, for, for agriculture. Um, is agrivoltaics. So being able to graze, keep bees, grow vegetables um, under these solar panels, if we just raise these solar panels up, um, these thousand acre solar farms could be potentials around urban centers um, uh, for land access. But also that barn that you saw in the first picture, that green roof, in a year or two, that's going to be all solar. And then our shop roof is going to, anyway, we're going to have about 3,500 square foot of panels on our roofs. You don't have to have them. We don't have to have them out in the fields ourselves. But every farmer should be doing this down the road. And everybody, all you guys who own your own homes, can sure as heck do it too. You know, it's a step in the right direction. 
huge. You went my overtime. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you.